does anyone remember from the from the the lecture or the module what are the principles of partial coverage that if you follow they're pretty much going to work every time what uh, well we're partial coverage so uh, you know we're going to have fairly uniform mirror occlusal reduction, although that gets a little bit, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm looking for things more like 360 degree bevel. Okay, so you need, you need a bevel or a chamfer type margin or a chisel type margin all the way around the preparation. Even though that margin may go up and down and it's gonna follow the outline of your damage, you do have to have that configuration all the way around. And why is that? Why is that important? Why don't we just do a butt margin? Better, better closure. Yep, exactly. We get better <laughs> marginal closure. So not only does that bevel configuration help close the margin, but the steeper the bevel, the more the closure, right? So uh, a beveled margin is, is great. The other thing a beveled margin will do, if you noticed on your onlay preparations, between the bevel that surrounds the mesial box and the bevel that surrounds the distal box, you actually get some retention from the two bevels working, you know, working with each other. They're like opposing axial walls. They're not a full axial wall, but those two bevels need to have a little taper right to them they follow the path of insertion and they will provide some resistance and retention form to the preparation so the first thing is the 360 degree bevel what's the next one where does the retention come from on these with the grooves, so internal retention. Everything is internal, right? We're not getting many, if any, opposing axial walls. Now on the three-quarter crown and the seven-eighths crown, you get a mesial and a distal axial wall. That helps on the, on the seven-eighths. You get, a, in addition to that, a buckle, or excuse me, a lingual and part of a buckle, okay, to, to help with the resistance and retention. So what do we mean by internal retention? We're going inside the tooth now to get that resistance and retention form. And what are we doing to get that? What, what shapes are we using? Boxes. And many times they're what's left over from a restoration that was removed. We just have to put a taper to it. Because they oftentimes don't have that taper. What about an isthmus? Same thing, we line up the isthmus, we, we define it. Uh, what else? So box forms, isthmus. What are we using on these last two preparations specifically to be a replace, yeah, retention groups, to be a replacement for a missing axial wall or part of a missing axial wall? We're using retention groups. So all of it is internal. It's inside where, where we get the resistance and, re and retention. Now, because we can't have a full axial wall, opposing axial wall, that's where we get our resistance and retention with full coverage. All of our internal retention is shorter, isn't it? And it's not that, you know, four or five millimeter length stuff. We don't have as much. So partial coverage are not ideal bridge abutments. They'll usually loosen, but they're great for single units. They're great for conserving tooth structure. Really great for that. Really, really, really good for conserving tooth structure. Uh, so, many advantages to partial coverage. I often hear this, and, and it, it's valid, it's a valid point, but it becomes irrelevant if you make a really nice margin, and that is what is the most vulnerable part of an indirect restoration clinically? The margin, right? 
That's why we make such a big deal about making a nice smooth margin. So recurrent carries at the margin. With partial coverage, is the total marginal length longer or shorter? It's longer, isn't it? It travels up, it travels down, it travels around, it goes, it, it's a longer linear margin. And so the, the, I'll call it an excuse, a bit of an excuse, but the reasoning that, well, we're not going to do partial coverage because it makes the margin longer and that's the weakest link. Well, if you make a nice margin and the margin is largely accessible to clean out on the buckle, the lingual, those are going to last. And, and the research tends to back that up and so does just the longevity of these restorations. So even though your margin is a little longer, if you do a nice job with the margin, that's not a negative. Yes? So in terms of price-wise for the patient, is a partial coverage like significantly cheaper than full coverage? No. So the question is about cost. Is a partial coverage less? I charge the same. They took me the same amount of time, sometimes longer but I charge whatever a full coverage crown is. Um, now, you'll notice with many insurance allowances, they'll have a kind of a sliding scale based upon surfaces for partial coverage. And so for round numbers, if a crown's a thousand, a four surface onlay might be 850 or 900, three surface might be 750 or 800, you know, and so forth. It doesn't make any sense. It takes just as much time, and it's not really the material that you're charging for so much, although gold is spendy and can have an effect on that. Um, the other thing that comes into play with partial coverage is sometimes the dividing line between partial and full coverage gets really foggy, really obscure. Um, you can do onlays sometimes, and because the tooth is so short, for all intents and pur purposes, it, it's full coverage, because it's going right down to the gum line almost everywhere around the tooth, including, and especially in approximately, where there might be box forms. So the line gets a little bit, we, we, you know, we have a, we define these as seven eighths and three quarters and onlays, but truly, between an, an onlay or an inlay, a, a simple inlay, and full coverage, it's a sliding, it, it truly is everything in between. Because you will do some crown preparations that would be very much like an onlay, but they, or a three quarter crown, or a seven eighths, and they'd be, for all intents and purposes, full coverage. Now, when you get to a seven eighths, if you've got that little mesial buccal cusp left, and the reason those crowns were done as seven eighths in the old days, uh, where gold was one of the old, only restorative indirect materials that we had, it was for aesthetic purposes. If there was an intact mesial buccal cusp, if it was prepared nicely, you could save the outline of the tooth, and you could conserve tooth structure. If that but, but as a practical matter, if that cusp gets really small, you're better off going to full coverage at that point. You know, don't, don't have a mesial buccal cusp that's left that is largely gone by your preparation. That, that's one where it's better to cross the line and do full coverage. If you can save the entire buccal aspect of the tooth, do it. A three-quarter crown is a great, great service, okay? So that's the second thing. What are what what other principles? They're in the they're in the lecture. What's that? Yeah. Minim so minimize exposure of metal. That's certainly an important principle with this. With every partial coverage that, that I do, I tell the patient, if you have any reservations about any metal showing anywhere, don't do it. If it's, if it's a metallic partial coverage, because some will show, okay? Even, even in spite of our best efforts to try to hide it, some will show, okay? So they have to be comfortable with some gold display. What else? What's that? That's important. 
where, where they go. And many times they're dictated by what was there. So oftentimes you'll do a three quarter crown with internal retentive features based upon what you just took out of that tooth. And maybe there was a big MOD restoration. And so you end up with internal retentive features that are very similar to an onlay only rather than not preparing the lingual surfaces of the tooth, if there's damage there, make an axial wall there. But rather than having a mesial and a distal retentive groove like we're showing you on this, this ideal three-quarter crown, you can achieve the same or better internal retention with mesial and distal box forms and an isthmus. You can do the same thing. So, so yeah. The, the, the important thing is that you line them up so they have a nice path of insertion, no undercuts, that's hard to do, and they're not over tapered. You wanna keep them in that six to 10 degree taper if you can, okay? There's a couple more things I want you to be thinking or refer to the lecture on the principles of partial coverage. But while you're looking that up, Let's talk about your retentive grooves. If you, have any of you placed your retentive grooves and realized after you placed your second groove they're not parallel? I do it all the time. I, I put my, my main groove in, I line up the best I can my second groove, and then I look at them and I realize they don't line up exactly. So what do you do when that happens? Because it'll happen. It happens to all of us. Anybody dealt with it? You just start over, get a new tooth? What's that? So it's along those lines. So this is what you need to do. Let's say that uh, how's the best way to draw this? We're gonna we're gonna put a You can kind of see that. Here is so there's one of my retentive grooves. We're looking at either mesial distal on a three-quarter crown. Okay. Let's say that my other retentive groove on the other side of the tooth looks like this. No, that's too close. Sorry. I didn't know I could see. Well, they obviously don't line up, right? Yeah. So they don't have a common path of insertion. So what do you do when that happens? Any thoughts? Okay, you've got to enlarge one or the other, or both, so that you're on the right thought process here. Okay, so enlarge a little bit, so you put your burr back in, first thing you got to do is decide which one you want to correct. Sometimes it's just one, and that's easier, because then you're just trying to correct the one. Now, if both of them, if you feel like they're way off, then correct one, and then start looking at the second one to line it up with the first one, okay? Well, let's say that one's off, you've identified the, the one that you want to correct, and I would say, quite honestly, this one, this, this red one gives me a better path of insertion with this axial wall, doesn't it? So the one I want to correct now is the one that I'm looking at, the one, the one that's outlined in black. So the way you do that, if you were to put your, you, you go back in with your 171 burr, it's very easy to try to, to try to change the angulation of this and end up doing something like, and I hope you can kind of see what I'm doing here, but all of your enlargement has to occur toward the occlusal aspect of the groove. If as you're tipping your burr, the tip of the bird digs in, you'll hourglass it, okay? So if I'm gonna correct this one here, 
the only choice that I have is to come over and do something like this. And because of the proximity to this bevel, I've, I've got to decide, is that really my best choice? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe I have to move the bevel a little bit when I'm all done. But I would try to make the primary part of structure removal right there to help it line up with this. Why weren't you able to do the other wall? Well, if I'm trying to line the black oh, one up with the red one, yeah. the only, and I'm trying to deal with a occlusal aspect only, I see. that's my only choice. So I've got to take it off up here. The tendency, and this happens so easily, it happens to me, and I've done a lot of these. The tendency is sometimes when you go into, to, I'm, I'm intentionally trying to take off this part It'll do this, and you'll dig in down at the bottom of your groove, and you'll end up with a groove that's shaped like this. And you'll have an undercut right there. So you, you just need to make sure that you're doing your corrective work from the tip of the groove, mainly to the occlusal. That's your 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 you're increasing the taper of the one groove to line up better with the other groove. Any questions on that concept? And some of you will have to do that and you'll have one groove that's a little bit bigger than the other groove, okay? Anybody get to that part in the lecture about the principles of partial coverage? Did we cover them all? I think there's one more. Let's see. Yeah, base up to ideal is indicated. Yeah? Okay, retention grooves need to be in Denton. That's important. Uh, you can't put retention grooves out in enamel. It's, it's too brittle, too fragile. Doesn't have the tensile strength that we need. Uh, base up to ideal, what does that mean? So oftentimes these teeth that you're doing partial coverage on have a big canyon through the middle, mesial to distal. They had an existing great big MOD whatever, MOD BL PQRZ, and you take it <laughs> out, and you look at it and you say, if I do an ax, if I do a typical full coverage crown, my buccal and lingual axial walls are gone. But if I do partial coverage, because I've got good buccal and lingual surfaces, and I can get my retention internally, sometimes those work really nice, and they're better than taking away the very two structure that's going to hold it all in place, right? But because there can be so much damage to the center of the tooth, we put a base in, we put a foundation in, and we base up to ideal. And we do that for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is so that you you get rid of all that irregular structure down through the center and you're able to actually put boxes and an isthmus with a floor on it. The secondary reason is you're going to use a lot less of that expensive gold alloy, but the most important reason is you will create an insulation layer for the pulp rather than putting a great big gold nugget through the center of the tube. Does that make sense? So clinically, if you ever do one of these or you're doing a, a gold crown, we want you to either do a build up or base up to ideal if you have more than two millimeters of clearance from the opposing tooth structure. Because, you know, there's no reason to spend $700 for a gold casting. Uh, and there's more of a tendency for it to create a sensitive tooth because there's no insulation at all in that metal. But if you base up to ideal, you still get all the benefits of the partial coverage gold, you create the insulation that you need, the thermal insulation, and you use a lot less material, okay? Question. Are we, are we that, or is it really kind of the same? 
Where, you're talking about with basing the ideal? Yeah, and again, it's just you base to a point where you had a, in, theoretically, there was no damage to the tooth and you were doing the preparation just like on a typodont tooth. So you base up to the ideal clearances. And in some places that base would be really thin maybe, and in other places it might be really thick. But the base is always anchored with good dentin underneath it. And the, the retentive features always have to have their corners in dentin. So if you had a base on the side of a tooth, like, like this, let's, uh, let's say that, um, what's the best way to show this? There's an illustration in, in the module that shows it's probably better than I can draw it because I took the time to draw it in the module. But if you had, if you had, if this was all damage, kind of through the center part of the tube. Okay, that's all damaged and you're gonna base up to ideal. You have to have a taper. If you have that much damage and you base the ideal, so what that means is you're gonna put a, you're gonna put a box or at least a, an isthmus floor there. You have to create a taper like that in the isthmus form in your, um, in the box form itself, and this doesn't know, I've got to do another drawing to illustrate this better, but in the box form itself, your box would have to go beyond the corners of this base. So it would have to be at least anchored like that and that. You see how it's anchoring into the dentin in the corners. I'm not anchoring a box form into the buildup or the base material. Because that's only as strong as your bond, the bond of your base to your tooth. Does that make sense? All retentive features have to at least have their corners anchored in dentin. Even though parts of it may, may be based up to ideal. Okay. Um, does that answer your question? So I think I, I think I see what you're getting at. If if your buccal and lingual remaining axial walls are so thin that even doing partial coverage and doing an onlay, sometimes we just don't have a very strong tooth, you know, and we and, and we do have to take those axial walls down. So if you had a upper tooth and there was so much damage that by the time you line things up with a path of insertion these are really really thin and what's really thin I mean you kind of have to do a judgment call and look at it and say Gosh, okay, I'm okay with partial coverage. I've got to bevel this, right? I'm going to put bevel here. I'm going to do my occlusal reduction here. And basically your preparation will look kind of like that. I'm not too worried about this side, but this side is somewhat worrisome. And yeah, you can get to a point where it's so thin that you've, you've gone beyond the bounds of partial coverage now and you need to go to full coverage and you realize that when you go to full coverage, what's gonna happen? That wall's gone. And now your tooth looks something like this. And so if you cannot get either internally or externally retention from the remaining tooth structure, 
your only other option at this point is root canal and a post to anchor your buildup. We don't like to do that to teeth, but sometimes we, we have to because there is so little tooth structure left that we have to cross that line and go that direction. As a general rule though, if you have a reasonable amount of buccal and lingual axial wall tooth structure remaining and your damage is primarily through the MOD area, partial coverage is a really good way to go because it does conserve what tooth structure you do have left and it gets the retention from the part of the tooth that's already damaged anyway. And oftentimes you can get a really nice restoration on that tooth that they last a long, long time. They last every bit as long or longer than full coverage, okay? And you've saved a lot of tooth structure and you haven't crossed that line where you cut off some really important tooth structure now. So there was another question. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, what do you say to the patient in that situation where you tell them that they're coming in for like an inline or something and then you're like, oh, now we have to do a root canal. It's a really good, so what, what, do you, what do you say to the patient where, oops, we just, we just cut off. Experience will teach you a lot so that beforehand you'll look at those teeth and say to the patient, this tooth's had a lot of damage. I don't know for sure what the best approach is going to be and I'll often have that conversation with patients and say to them, you know, if this were my tooth and I could do partial coverage gold, I'd do it. But are you comfortable with some display of gold in your mouth? Some people will say flat out, no. Now, we do have partial coverage ceramic that we're gonna talk about next semester. And, and I do a lot of those too, we do a lot of those. They're, they're a, a really good option for, they're an aesthetic option for something that otherwise would have been you know, gold. They're a little more aggressive just because they're a weaker material but they still do conserve tooth structure. But I'd have that discussion ahead of time so that the patient was pretty much prepared for, hey, we're gonna make the decision what's best for this tooth when we get to that point in the preparation. And they're very good with that and I involve them in that decision-making process. But they were usually, they've been prepared for what could happen. So, yeah, you don't wanna put, you don't wanna paint yourself into a corner where you look like the bad guy that really screwed up on this tube. And so a little, a little just uh, preemptive education with the patient is, is, is a help, really helpful thing so that they're prepared. Yeah, good, good question. Any other questions on, on retentive features, basing up to ideal, the principles of partial coverage, how do you make it work? I like to try to, it, 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 before we end this discussion, if you can do this one thing clinically, it will help you immensely. When you're looking at a tooth that needs to be restored for whatever reason, and there's, there's existing restorations in that tooth that you're gonna be cutting out, imagine in your mind's eye what it will look like by removing the axial walls. And if it looks like removing the axial walls is gonna get rid of the rest of the coronal tooth structure or a good portion of it, those are the ones that you sometimes need to say to the patient, this tooth might need a root canal so that we can get a restoration to stay in place. There's, it's badly damaged and have that conversation with them or consider partial coverage, okay? So any other questions about partial coverage in your experience so far? Anything else I can do to help you prepare for the practical on the temporary or the preparations? You cannot have an undercut anywhere. I mean, obviously there's no path of insertion. So when you look down on your preparations, you have to be able to see all of your margins at the same time with one eye closed. If you can't see the entirety of the margin around both teeth, you have an undercut someplace. If you make your temporary and you're frustrated because it keeps tearing on you, there's probably an undercut someplace. Okay? We good?